Chapter 5, Guerrero in the Modern World. <laughs> we don't fuck Vince! We're buddies, we're pals, we're partners, we're a duo. We love each other, but we don't fuck! We're fucking stars! We can, we can travel together! Okay. We can hang out together! We can live together, but we can't be queers! It's not funny! We don't need to dig in studies or the ancient dustbins of history to find Guerrero. Even within our homophobic society, there have been plenty of masculine men who have had relationship with others like them. I don't want to review or copy the entire record of anything that could be labeled homosexual, as that has been done better elsewhere and needlessly includes the non-masculine. Instead, I've compiled five short excerpts that highlight just Guerrero. Two are fictional accounts that not only represent universal truths exceptionally well, but also have relevant backstories. Writhing Bedfellows. In 1826, two young men from South Carolina exchanged letters addressed to Jim from Jeff. Quote, I feel some inclination to learn whether you yet sleep in your shirt tail and whether you have the extravagant delight of poking and punching a writhing bedfellow with your long flesh and pole, the exquisite touches of which I have often had the honor of feeling. Let me say unto thee that unless thou changest former habits in this particular, thou wilt be represented by every future chum as a nuisance, and I pronounce it with good reason too. Sir, you roughen the downy slumbers of your bedfellow by such hostile, furious lunges as you are in the habit of making at him when he is, at l when he is least prepared for defense against the crushing force of a battering ram." End quote. Jeff signed the letter with a valediction, with great respect, I am the old stud. In two short decades, Jim became James Henry Hammond, the governor of South Carolina. Later in the U.S. Senate, he popularized the term King Cotton in reference to the South's most famous crop. His, quote, elong elongated protuberance, to quote Jeff, took an interest in multiple young women, causing a whisper campaign that he dismissed as, quote, a little dalliance with the other sex. His writhing bedfellow, Jeffrey, grew up to become the Honorable Judge Withers, a signatory to both South Carolina's secession and the Confederate Constitution. The most beatific look. 150 years later, two boys would also become writhing bedfellows in a small town in a big southern state. Recount the, recounting the experience in his 40s, Luke writes, quote, When I was 17 in 1971, a boy moved to town from my state's biggest city. I am sure this was quite a culture shock for him. He was 16 years old, a freshman, and his name was Stephen. End quote. Luke invited Stephen to his grandfather's ranch to hunt and spend the night. After deciding that it was okay to sleep in the same bed, quote, we continued to talk and the conversation turned to sex. Specifically, Stephen asked me if I masturbated. I answered, yes, I did. To say that I was sexually naive would be a gross understatement. My experience with girls had been limited, and I was not what you, you would call sexually bold. That said, even then asked if I had ever jacked off with another guy. Well, no, I hadn't. It was at this point he said he wanted to show me something that he and a buddy of his from the big city used to do. End quote. They both enjoyed it. Quote, it was like I had been electrified. I could not believe the indescribable feeling of his hand on our cocks together. He stroked once, twice, and I came as powerfully as I ever had. The first ejaculate hit me directly under the chin, the second landed splat on my chest. My head was literally spinning because I had never felt this kind of pleasure solo. Another time we played it for all we could, wrestling closely together, then moving apart and fondling one another, moving closer together with our legs entwined, both of our hands grasping and stroking our dicks until finally we came, almost simultaneously, while sitting, face, while, uh, while sitting facing one another. I collapsed into Stephen, and then I kissed him full on the lips, my tongue curious for his, and he returned the kiss urgent and hot." End quote. The hunting trips became a tradition, and the two grew on each other. Quote, sometimes we had little wrestling matches. Sometimes we were gentler, and sometimes we were extremely physical. It was all good, and I never tired of looking at Stephen's face as he was about to come. 
he would get the most beatific look, his eyelids fluttering slightly as he gasped and made little noises. That, in and of itself, was enough to get me off big time. Sometime around Thanksgiving, as I recall, I told Stephen I thought I, that I loved him. He admitted that he thought he loved me too. I had to admit, although I was conflicted about the nature of our relationship, I was over the moon." End quote. Alone in the woods, they were safe, but at Stephen's house, they were ultimately caught having sex. Quote, Suddenly, someone burst through the locked door. I, lo uh, I looked up and saw that it was Stephen's father. I jumped up and the colonel began yelling at Stephen, calling him a little faggot and how he should kick his ass and how he could do this, etc., etc. I was embarrassed by my nakedness and a bit intimidated by the colonel. He was a pretty big guy and he definitely and he had definitely blown a gasket. After a minute, I jumped in and said I didn't think that this was Stephen's fault and I told him we hadn't done anything wrong. At this point, the colonel backhanded me. I had never believed in the old saying, seeing stars when you hit hard, but I did literally see stars and the next thing to hit the floor was my ass." End quote. Luke would never see Stephen again. The City and the Pillar While Luke and Stephen had to meet secretly, the first novel to unabashedly describe such a relationship was written two decades before in 1948 when The City and the Pillar invented homosexuality. Better its author Gore Vidal than me explain. Quote, I knew that my description of the love affair between two normal all-American boys of the sort that I had spent three years with in the wartime army would challenge every superstition about sex in my native land. Until then, American novels of an aversion dealt with transvestites or with lonely bookish boys who married unhappily and pined for marines. I broke that mold. My two lovers were athletes and so drawn to the entirely masculine that in the case of one, Jim Willard, the feminine was simply irrelevant to his passion to unite with his other half, Bob Ford. Unfortunately for Jim, Bob had other sexual plans involving women and marriage. This, uh, end quote, this earned Vidal a ban from the New York Times reviewing his five next books. Poignant but not explicit, uh, an excerpt from the novel. They were very still. Jim found the weight of Bob's arm on his shoulders almost unbearable, wonderful, but unbearable. Yet he did not dare move for fear the other would take his arm away. Suddenly, Bob got to his feet. Let's make a fire. There, he said, looking into the yellow flames. That's done. For a long moment, both stared into the hypnotically quivering flames, each possessed by his own private daydream. Bob's dream ended first. He turned to Jim. Come on, he said menacingly, I'll wrestle you. They met, grappled, fell to the ground. Pu pushing and pulling, they fought for position. They were evenly matched because Jim, though stronger, would not allow Bob to lose or to win. When at last they stopped, both were panting and sweating. They lay exhausted on the blanket. Then Bob took off his shirt and Jim did the same. That was better. Jim mopped the sweat from his face while Bob stretched out on the blanket, using his shirt for a pillow. Firelight gleamed on the pale skin. Jim stretched out beside him. Too hot, he said. Too hot to be wrestling. Bob laughed and suddenly grabbed him. They, glung, they clung to one another. Jim was overwhelmingly conscious of Bob's body. For a moment, they pretended to wrestle. Then they stopped. Yet each continued to cling to the other as though waiting for a signal to break or to begin again. For a long time neither moved, smooth chest touching, sweat mingling, breathing fast in unison. Abruptly, Bob pulled away. For a bold moment their eyes met, then deliberately, gravely, Bob shut his eyes and Jim touched him. As he had so many times in dreams, without words, without thought, without fear. When the eyes are shut, the true world begins. As faces touched, Bob gave a shuddering sigh and gripped Jim tightly in his arms. Now they were complete, each became the other, as their bodies collided with a primal violence, like to like, mental to magnet, half to half, and the whole restored. So they met, eyes tight shut against an irrelevant world. A wind warm and sudden shook all the trees, scattered the fire's ashes through shadows to the ground. But then the wind stopped, the fire went to coals, the trees went silent, no comets marked the dark, lovely sky, and the moment was gone. In the fast beat of a double heart, it died. 
The eyes opened again. The bodies faced one another where only an instant before a universe had lived. The star burst and dwindled, spiraling them both down to the meager, to the separate, to the night and the trees and the firelight, all so much less than what had been. They separated, breathing hard. Jim could feel the fire on his feet, and beneath the blanket, he was now uncomfortably aware of small stones and sticks. He looked at Bob, not certain of what he would see. Bob was staring into the fire, face expressionless, but he grinned quickly when he saw Jim watching him. This is a hell of a mess, he said, and the moment fled. Jim looked down at himself and said as casually as he could, it sure is. Bob stood up and the firelight glittering on his body. Let's wash up. Pale as ghosts in the dark of night, they walked to the pond. Through the trees they could see the light from their fire, yellow and flickering, while frogs croaked, insects buzzed, river thundered. They dove into the still black water. Not until they had returned to the fire did Bob break the silence. He was abrupt. You know, that was awful kid stuff we did. I suppose so, Jim paused, but I liked it. He had great courage now that he made his secret dream reality. Did you? Bob frowned into the yellow fire. Well, it was different than with a girl, and I don't think it's right. Why not? Well, guys aren't supposed to do that with each other. It's not natural. I guess not. Jim looked at Bob's fire-colored body, long-lined and muscular. With his newfound courage, he put his arm around Bob's waist. Again excited, they embraced and fell back onto the blanket. End excerpt. Dedicated for the memory of J.T., Vidal's novel was inspired by his real-life relationship with Jimmy Trimble. While the two's relationship was short and any hope of a reunion was undercut by Jimmy's death on Iwo Jima during World War II, Vidal says that Jimmy was the only, uh, was the only uh, he ever loved, his unfinished business. Quote, I not only never again encountered the other half, but by the time I was 25, I had given up all pursuit, settling for a thousand brief anonymous adhesions, where wholeness seems for an instant to be achieved." End quote. My own private Idaho. Unrequited love and unfinished business are the fate of many such relationships when they have neither a name nor acceptance. In cinema, Guerrero has no better illustration than in my own private Idaho. Taking a page or two from The City on the Pillar, the pivotal scene in the movie features two young hustlers around a campfire. Getting away from everything feels good. Yeah, it does. When I left home, the maid asked me where I was off to. I said, wherever, whatever. Have a nice day. You had a maid? Yeah. If I had a normal family and a good upbringing, then I would have been a well-adjusted person. <laughs> Depends on what you call normal. Yeah, it does. Well, you know, normal, like, like a mom and a dad and a dog and shit like that. Normal. Normal. So you didn't have a normal dog? No, I didn't have a dog. You didn't have a, a normal dad? I didn't have a dog or, 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 or a normal dad anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. I don't feel sorry for myself. I, mean, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, you know, well adjusted. <laughs> What's a normal dad? I don't know. I'd like to talk with you. I mean, I'd like to uh, really talk with you. I mean, we're talking right now, but you know, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I can be. Oh. I don't feel like I can be close to you. I mean, we're close. Right now, we're close, but I mean, you know. I. Uh. How close? I mean... Uh, I don't know. Whatever. What? What do I mean to you? 
What do you mean to me? Mike, you're my best friend. I know, man. I know I'm not. I know I'm your friend. We're good friends, and it's good to be, you know, good friends. That's a good thing. So? So I just... That's okay. be friends. I only have sex with a guy for money. Yeah, I know. And two guys can't love each other. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, for me, I could love someone even if I you know, wasn't paid for it. I love you and you don't pay me. Mike. I really want to kiss you, man. I love you, though. You know that. I do love you. The two embrace, but we see nothing else. While the director, Gus Van Sant, is gay, he originally wrote the scene about a horny Mike needing a quick fuck instead of anything committal. Quote, in the original script, he doesn't tell Scott that he loves him, but he does ask him if he fools around with guys, and Scott says, well, I only sleep with guys for money, and River says, yeah, but we're out in the desert and it's boring, end quote. However, by rewriting the script, River Phoenix changed not just the scene, but the rest of the movie. In a later scene, after Scott picks up an Italian chick, his future wife, an annoyed Mike puffs smoke into the girl's face. Without the campfire scene, Mike is merely annoyed at a distraction from the broader goal of finding his deadbeat mother. With it, we see an interplay of jealousy, fear of abandonment, and Grero. As with the city and the pillar, art imitates life. Quote from an article. While filming his previous movie, Dogfight, Phoenix had received oral sex from another male actor saying he needed to do it because he was going to play a gay hustler. He had other brief involvements with other men, uh, with men over the years, and it was no big deal to friends who knew. Phoenix simply didn't censor his affections. If he loved somebody, male or female, says one of Phoenix's longtime girlfriends, Suzanne Solgott, he felt he should check it out. End quote. Quote, River dropped clues about his sexuality, but I never followed them up, says Van Sant who is gay. Phoenix asked ceaseless questions about Van Sant's uh, relationship with his boyfriend. What exactly do you do in bed? Which side do you sleep on? Do you ever tell him to shut up? If you're angry at him, do you still buy him an expensive birthday present? Van Sant says, I would laugh because these questions were so personal and he'd say, what? What? In late 1992, a, a gay filmmaker not Van Sant, staying at the Chateau Marmont in, in Los Angeles, heard a knock at midnight and discovered Phoenix outside, drunk and wanting to talk about his struggles with bisexuality. The filmmaker reassured him that it would all work out. End quote on the excerpt. Boarding school hijinks. Noted author and professional atheist Christopher Hitchens had relevant experiences in boarding school. Quote, and this is an excerpt from the book. Mr. Chip's feminist socialist wife had phrased it in a no-nonsense way by saying that official disapproval of public school homosexuality was the equivalent of condemning a boy for being there in the first place. I knowingly run the risk of absurdity if I offer the spiritual or the transcendent in opposition to this, but actually it was my first exposure to love as well as to sex, and it helped teach me as vividly as anything could have done that religion was cruel and stupid. One was indeed punishable for one's very nature, created, created sick, con, uh, commanded to be sound. The details aren't very important, but until this I have doubted 
if I would ever be able to set them down. He was a sort of strawberry blonde, very slightly bow-legged, or bow-legged, with a wicked smile that seemed to promise both innocence and experience. He was in another house. He was my age. He was quite right-wing, which I swiftly decided to forgive, but also a rebel in the sense of being a cavalier elitist. The marvelous boy was more urbane uh, than I was, and much more knowing, if slightly less academic. His name was Guy, and I still sometimes twitch a little when I run into someone else who's called that, even in America, where in a way it is everybody's name. Were poems, ex were poems exchanged? Were there white hot and snatch kisses? Did we sometimes pine for the holidays to end so that, unlike everybody else, we actually yearn to be back at the school? Yes, yes, and yes. Did we sleep together? Well, dear reader, the straight answer is no, we didn't. The heated yet chaste embrace was exactly what marked us off from the grim and turgid and randy manipulations in which the common herd, not excluding ourselves in our lover moments with in our lower moments with lesser beings partook. I won't deny that there wasn't some falling. However, when we were actually caught, it must have looked bad since we had finally managed no small achievement in a place where any sort of privacy was rendered near unlawful to find somewhere to be alone. The senior boy made the discovery was a thick-necked sportocrat with the unimprovable name of Peter Raper. He had had his own bulging eye on my guy for some time, and this was his revenge. The usual thing would have, been f would have been public disgrace followed by expulsion, but things were made both more cruel and more arbitrary, and also less so. Various of my teachers persuaded the headmaster that I was a good prospect for passing the entrance exam for Oxford, a, statistics, a statistic on which the school annually prided and sold itself. The same could be said of Guy, though he didn't eventually make it. Accordingly, having been coldly exposed to public shame, we were allowed to stay on, but forbidden to speak to each other. At the time, I vaguely, but quite worriedly, thought this might have the effect of killing me." End quote. No comment needed.